Oh, many of you know that a few weeks ago, we started a sermon series that we called Model T. Now, we got this idea from one of the most famous people in American history, whose name was Henry Ford. And in the early 1900s, Henry Ford made a name for himself by creating a car that changed the way Americans lived, worked, and traveled. In fact, his idea of mass producing a car was so revolutionary that from 1908 to 1927, the Ford Motor Company made over 150 million Model Ts. And the result was the Model T was one of the best selling cars in history. But what most people don't realize is the process of designing a car for the general public, it ain't easy. Right? He had to overcome enormous obstacles along the way. In fact, when he first started his business, he burned through all of his investors' cash without even producing a car. Now, eventually, he did produce a car, raised another 60 grand in venture capital, and that company went bankrupt. And then, in the 1920s, Ford refused to update the Model T which led to a dramatic decrease in sales. See, Henry Ford's idea of being the preeminent car manufacturer wasn't for the faint at heart. So here's the question that we need to ask. What made Henry Ford continue to go through all this adversity? Why didn't he just throw in the towel and quit and say, you know what, I'm done with all this? And the answer is pretty simple. See, the reason why Henry Ford didn't quit, the reason he went on to produce one of the best-selling cars in history is because he was bold and he was daring. He was willing to do whatever it took to get the job done because Ford knew when you want to create something amazing, you got to pay a price. But there's another reason why Henry Ford persevered wasn't just because he was bold and daring. See, he had the most important ingredient lodged in his heart. He believed what he was doing was right. And there was nothing, and I mean nothing, that was going to stop him from accomplishing his task. But here's the fascinating part. While Henry Ford set the standard for mass car production, there was a church in the Bible that set a standard too. Now, they didn't set a record for Sunday school attendance or how many people came to their Easter service. Scripture tells us that this congregation set the standard of what an effective church should look like. Look what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 1.7. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Now, don't miss what the Bible's saying here, because Scripture tells us that this group of believers was so amazing and so committed that their faith in God became known all over the world. And the Bible doesn't say that about any other congregation of people, which leads us to ask a very important question. And that question is, what made this church so different? What was it about this group of people that was so infectious and so contagious that they became the model? Well, this morning, we're going to look at one of the key ingredients that made this church so unique. But in order for this section of Scripture to make sense, i got to give you a little bit of background information so you kind of have an idea as to what's going on. Now, at this time in history... The Apostle Paul would travel around the Mediterranean Rim and he would plant churches. Now that doesn't mean that he would go to a city and put up big buildings and have churches every Sunday. It's not what it was. Because the Greek word for church is ekklesia, which means a movement of people, not a religious building. It's a movement of people. And what Paul would do is he would go in to these cities around the Mediterranean Rim and he would tell people the truth about God's love. And he would try to create a movement of people 
that understood the truth for themselves. Now, he would stay with that group for a period of time, and then he would elect elders to watch over that spiritual growth of, that, of those folks, and then he would go to another city and plant another church. But when he left the city, it wasn't out of sight, out of mind. See, Paul didn't forget about the congregations or the churches that he planted. And what he would do is he would write letters to these churches, and he would either give them praise or correction or both. In fact, the majority of the New Testament are letters that Paul wrote to churches that he planted. Now, the Bible tells us in Acts 17 that Paul went to the city of Thessalonica. And while he was there, a group of people gave their life to Christ. But after he left, Paul wrote this congregation a letter. And it's in this letter that we understand what made this church so special. Look at what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 2.1. You know, brothers and sisters, that our visit to you was not without results. So right off the bat, Paul is saying, hey, when we told you the truth about God's love, we got some amazing results because many of you gave your life to Christ and got baptized, which was awesome. But look at what Paul wrote in verse 2. He said, we had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. Now, before I go on, i got to explain something, because this is kind of easy to just read over and gloss over. In this verse, Paul is reminding this new congregation just how dangerous it was to be a follower of Jesus at this time. Because before Paul went to the city of Thessalonica, he was in the city of Philippi. And it was in this city that we see one of the most traumatic events that Paul went through. Look at what happened in Acts 16, 16. Once we were going to a place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. So the Bible's telling us that Paul was in Philippi, there was a slave girl who earned a ton of cash for her owners. Now, she did this by fortune telling. Now, I don't know if she was legit or if she was some first century Miss Cleo, right? But she made her owners a lot of money by either reading crystal balls or reading palms, tarot cards or tea leaves. Whatever she did, she made them a lot of money. And verse 17 says, she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And she kept this up for many days. And I love Paul's response. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left. And verse 19 says, when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone. They seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews, which back in that culture was a racial slur. So it was more like, these men are Jews. And they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. But that wasn't true. It wasn't true at all. We just read it. Paul and Silas weren't throwing the city into an uproar. They were walking to a place of prayer. That's all they were doing. But when they realized that their endless hope of making just money over money over money, and they realized that their revenue stream was going to be interrupted, they were furious. So they grabbed Paul and Silas, took them before the local authorities, and accused them of literally everything you could possibly imagine. But then it gets worse, because verse 22 says, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. And after they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Now here's really the strange part of the story, because this is kind of peculiar. After Paul and Silas are unjustly arrested, 
stripped naked, beaten, and thrown in jail, the very next day, the magistrates ordered them to leave the city of Philippi, which they did. But then they immediately left Philippi and went to Thessalonica. Now, I'm going to be totally honest with you this morning. If this were me, right, if I were Paul, and I just got stripped naked, beaten with rods, and I had to spend the night in the box, I don't think I'm going to be talking about Jesus, at least for a week or two. I got to take a little break. But not Paul. See, Paul was totally different. Because as soon as he got to the city of Thessalonica, he started telling people about Jesus. Which is why Acts 17.1 says, When Paul and his companions passed through Amophilus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, which means this is what he did every time he came to the city. Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and proving the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. But why would Paul do that? I mean, think about it. After what he just experienced in Philippi, what would possess him to keep telling people about Jesus? Because he knew it would happen if he got caught, and he knew it would happen if the people got angry. But there was something inside of him that just compelled him to tell people the truth regardless of the consequences. And not only was Paul daring enough to tell him the truth, he communicated it in such a way that reflected the true nature of God. That's why verse 5 says, You know, we never used flattery, nor did we, did we put on a mask to cover up our greed. So Paul is saying, hey, when we told you the truth about God's love, we didn't buddy you up. We weren't flattering you. We weren't here for some get-rich-quick scheme. We didn't pimp out the Bible for cash. That's not what we were doing. Instead, Paul says, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you. Because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. And if you've ever wondered what a godly mom does, what it looks like to be a godly mom, Paul explains it in this passage perfectly. Because he's saying, hey, you know what a godly mom does? She doesn't just share her life with her children. She shares her faith. Because a godly mom knows that just the alphabet song and share your toys and be nice to others, there's more to it than that. A good mom shares her faith with her children. Because every good mom knows, no matter how well you teach your kid to read or how well they are in sports or academics, the one thing that's really going to last is your child's faith in Jesus. And if we're willing to be honest, I mean, if we're willing to be really honest with ourselves this morning, I think this sharing piece is where a lot of us struggle. Because some of us are just just starting out in our faith. Some of us are just kind of like exploring what this whole God thing means. That's okay. Some of you have been here for years. But some of us struggle with how to share our faith in Jesus. We want to, but we're not sure where to start. Because there's part of us that thinks, how would I do that? What would that look like? What would I say? Where would I start? But the worst thing is, what if somebody asks me a question that I can't answer? Then what? And I can tell you, I was totally, totally there. I didn't know how to tell people about God's love. I didn't know how to tell people about Jesus. I wouldn't even, if I, Jesus came up in a conversation, it would completely freak me out. I didn't know what to say. Because for me, it was always like this weird game of Bible jeopardy. Right? You'd be talking to somebody about Jesus, and then all of a sudden it's like, I'll take Adam and Eve for two on it. And then I don't know how to answer the question. So I say, oh, I, I don't know what to do. And then what? What do you do with that? But over the course of time, I've learned that telling people the truth about God's love, it's really not hard at all. As a matter of fact, I had a friend of mine in Jersey. His name is Jason Gallagher. 
And if you live in Jersey, you have a nickname because it's just what we do. And his was Jay Bones. And Jay, I've known him for over 20 years, and I knew him before I got saved, before I came to Christ. So he worked for me at the nightclub I used to manage. He was actually my assistant manager. And we worked a ton of hours together. We became really close over the years. Jay actually became like a brother to me. And when I got saved, when I accepted Christ, I wanted to tell him, but I didn't know how. I wouldn't know what to say. And then more importantly, what would he say? Would I lose him as a friend? What, what would that look like? So we're on the phone one day, and I don't remember what we were talking about, but it came up. The subject of my faith came up. So I told him, hey, you know, um, this is kind of where I'm at with, with my walk. You know, I'm a believer in Jesus. And, and I quote, really? Why? So over the next couple of months, I talked to him quite a bit about where I was in my walk and where I was in my faith. And the reason I shared it with him is the same reason why Paul went city to city to city. And it's the same reason why Velocity shares the truth about God's love. Because I love him. He's my friend. And I just wanted him to know what I know. I wasn't in it for me or money or fame. I just wanted my friend to understand the truth for himself. I would have never imagined that one day I would actually have the ability to tell somebody the truth about God's love. It never entered my mind. In fact, I never believed God could use somebody like me. And I'm going to say that one more time. I can't believe God used somebody like me to help somebody understand the truth for themselves. But he did. And the lesson that I've learned over the years is if you're willing to have these conversations with people, God can and God will use you in the most amazing ways. So what I want you to do is this. It's a beautiful Sunday morning and I want everybody to just stop and think about somebody in your life that's far from God. Mother, father, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, whoever. And I want you to think about a time you were talking to that person and maybe they were going through a struggle. And you thought to yourself, gosh, I just wish I could tell them the truth. Because if they understood the truth for themselves, it could change everything. Well, for those of you that have ever felt that way, you are in luck. Because in a few weeks, I'm going to be teaching a class called The ABCs to Knowing Jesus. And I'm going to show you how to tell people the truth about God's love. It's an approach that Velocity uses, and it's going to be held um, Tuesday, May 28th at the Mena Public Library from 7 to 8.30. Sign up at the front table. I promise you, you're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be a lot of fun. But now I know some of you are sitting in your chair. You're like, yeah, I'd like to do that. But I'm not a biblical scholar. And I can't memorize a Bible verse. I'm, I'm just going to skip out on it. Well, you're in luck again. Because here's the beauty of it. You don't have to be a biblical scholar. You don't have to memorize 50 verses of Scripture. All you have to be willing to do is sit down with somebody with a piece of paper and go over what's written. And if you'll be bold enough and you'll be daring enough to take an hour and a half, two hours out of your life and learn this, I promise you, you will see God use you in ways you never even fathomed. In fact, I've done this with so many people. The normal response I get is, that's it? Really? That's all I need to do? And that's exactly what Jay said, only it was much more colorful. We won't get into that here. Now, if you're somebody that's been in Velocity for only a few weeks, or maybe this is your first day, I invite you to come out and check it as well. There's no string attached, no pressure. We're not going to make you get up and present anything. But come and check it out for yourself. 
See what it's all about. I would just love for as many people to see this as possible. But here's the real important part, and this is the thing I think we need to wrap our heads around. The reason why this is so important is because one of the characteristics of the church in Thessalonica, one of the things that made this church the model over all other churches is these people were totally committed to telling people how to have a strong relationship with Jesus. And they were bold enough and they were daring enough to share it in spite of the opposition. And I really hope we can be too. Let me pray for us. So Heavenly Father, we, we, thank, you for, we thank you for this morning. You know, we thank you for the ability to be able to come here, be safe, learn about your word, and just take one step closer. And I pray, Lord, that some of those folks that are sitting here saying, yeah, I'd kind of like to check it out, but I don't know. Lord, I, just, I pray that those folks just kind of say, yeah, you know what, I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try and see what it's about. And I just pray, Lord, that you watch over all of us through the coming weeks, the summer months, as people are traveling. And I just hope you give us all the strength and courage to spread your word, because that's what we're supposed to do. And we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.